Thank you, Doug. Am I on here? We're good? Uh, so, a little confession. I can't hear anything out of this ear right now, um, so I can't tell that the mic's on, uh, but hopefully it is. So, um, a little leftover reminder of um, my deathbed experience last week. Uh, as I was also thinking about Memorial Day, um, it's important that we remember this day and remember those who sacrificed for our country, um, but I was also thinking about that we should be continually and on a daily basis remembering our history and our past as uh, believers, as Christ followers, looking back to the history of the church, looking back at those who uh, were martyred for Christ, that gave their lives for Christ. Um, it's on an even grander scale than just our country in the grand scheme of things. Um, and we can look back and see where there's rises and falls within the Christian church um, as people are growing, the church is growing as it falls backwards, depending on what culture it's in at the time, where it's at in history. Um, and we can remember the revivals that took place and um, the cool stuff there. We've got a really great history within the United States of a country built on um, faith and on Christ, um, but there's a lot of places in the world that don't have that. Um, but we, we've, in our own history, have seen revivals take place. Uh, and the cool thing about it is that even in these places where the gospel is being repressed, it still keeps moving forward and it's not going anywhere. Um, it continues on, even though there's 70,000 people in prison for their faith, there's still people speaking the gospel there in North Korea and around the world. Um, but as we're thinking about uh, revivals, who here has seen the movie, um, I'm totally just blanking on the name now, as I walk, see that's why I can't walk away from my notes. Uh, Jesus Revolution. Few people that haven't, but most people have seen it. Um, so, it's a, it's a a really good movie. I really enjoyed it. Our family enjoyed it. Um, we watched it a couple weeks ago at youth group. Um, it is a movie made by people, and there are probably some things in there that you may not agree with. Um, you might fully agree with, uh, but. Overall, it's got a really good message. The gospel is presented clearly. Um, and there was one thing in there that really stood out that I don't know if everyone thought was as big of a deal as I did. Um, it was kind of a small thing as the train goes by. Um, but it, it stood out to me. And that was that every time one of the guys got up to preach a sermon um, to share a message, they began it by taking their Bible, and they held it up, and everyone else in the congregation held up their Bible all at the same time, and he said, this is God's word, this is life. And then they would move on with their, with their message. Um, and I, I just thought that's a really cool reminder of how important this book is to us as believers um, as we grow in our faith and, and work through our faith and become closer followers of Christ. Um, now I'm not going to suggest that every week we start our sermon that way, that Steve stands up here and we all follow suit. Um, that might get a little weird, so we're not going to do that, but, um, but I, it's a neat reminder. So, But I was thinking, do we as believers have that same reverence for the Bible every time we hold it and every time we look at it? Do we recognize the impact that that book, that this book, can have on our individual lives daily? Uh, the author of Psalm 119, which many of you are familiar with, definitely understood the beauty of God's Word. We don't know who the author was of Psalms, of this Psalm, um, but we do know that he was passionate about studying the Torah, or that first five books of the Old Testament um, that they called it. I mean, he spouted off 176 verses 
that he carefully crafted in poetry, praising God for this gift and begging that God would help him apply it in his life. 176 verses. This is the longest single chapter in the entire Bible, and in itself is longer than several entire books. It is a celebration of God's word being the perfect guide to life. Now, I'm not going to sit here and have us read the entire thing, because that would take my whole time of being up here, which maybe some of you would prefer. Um, but if you could, if you could turn with me to Psalm 119, and we're just, we're going to read the first 40 verses, which is still a big chunk, but I think it gives you a good idea of the passion that this person, the psalmist, had for the Bible. Um, you can follow along and read as I read, or if it helps, feel free to just close your eyes and listen to these words that he put together, um, for us about God's word. How happy are those whose way is blameless, who walk according to the Lord's instruction. Happy are those who keep his decrees and seek him with all their heart. They do nothing wrong, they walk in his ways. You have commanded that your precepts be diligently kept. If only my ways were committed to keeping your statutes then I would not be ashamed when I think about all your commands. I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn your righteous judgments. I will keep your statutes, never abandon me. How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping your word. I have sought you with all my heart. Don't let me wander from your commands. I have treasured your word in my heart so that I may not sin against you. Lord, may you be blessed. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I proclaim all the judgments from your mouth. I rejoice in the way revealed by your decrees, as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and think about your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Deal generously with your servants so that I might live. Then I will keep your word. Open my eyes so that I may... Con contemplate wondrous things from your instruction. I am a resident alien on earth. Do not hide your commands from me. I am continually overcome with longing for your judgments. You rebuke the arrogant, the ones under a curse, who wander away from your commands. Take insult and contempt away from me, for I have kept your decrees. Though princes sit together speaking against me, your servant will think, think about your statutes. Your decrees are my delight and my counselors. My life is down in the dust. Give me life through your word. I told you about my life, and you answered me. Teach me your statutes. Help me understand the meaning of your precepts so that I can meditate on your wonders. I am weary from grief. Strengthen me through your word. Keep me from the way of deceit and graciously give me your instruction. I have chosen the way of the truth. I have set your ordinances before me. I cling to your decrees. Lord, do not put me to shame. I pursue the way of your commands, for you broaden my understanding. Teach me, O Lord, the meaning of your statutes, and I will always keep them. Help me understand your instruction, and I will obey it and follow it with all my heart. Help me stay on the path of your commands, for I take pleasure in it. Turn my heart to your decrees, and, do not, do, and not to dishonest profit. Turn my eyes from looking at what is worthless. Give me life in your ways. Confirm what you said to your servant, for it produces reverence for you. Turn away the disgrace I dread. Indeed, your judgments are good. How I long for your precepts. Give me life through your righteousness. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just read those words of the psalmist that uh, couldn't help himself but to cry out for you to show him yourself through your word, God. Just the passion for uh, the scriptures that breed life into this man's heart. I pray that we, as a congregation, as individuals, that we would 
be focused on your word as well, God, that we would count on your scriptures to breathe new life into us each and every day, God. We thank you and praise you, in Jesus' name, amen. So 156 million, 264,880. That's a big number, right? That is the number of book titles that have been estimated to have been published in the world as of 2022 since the Gutenberg printing press was invented in 1440. That doesn't include audiobooks and all that stuff. That is hardbound copies that have been printed. Also, I should say, this is a very rough estimate, and it came from an unverified website uh, that I found um, randomly. Uh, so don't take that number to heart, but it gives you the point that there are a lot of books in the world. So just stick with me on that. So what makes the Bible so special? What makes it the book that gives life? That's a big claim, and that's what we're going to look at. So the first thing that we have to realize that the Bible comes out of the fact that God finds pleasure in us knowing him, right? That is the purpose of his word for us. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 says, For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of God's glory in the face of Jesus Christ. God created us for relationship with him and has given his word because he wants us to know him. Criti critics of Christianity often may say, well, if God were real, then why doesn't he show himself to us? Oh, but he does. He's given us a lot that has shown himself to us. Ultimately, there are two ways in which God reveals himself to us, two ways that we can know him. What we call the general revelation, as well as the special revelation of God. The general revelation is what God has provided to all mankind, no matter who you are, if you have eyes, you've seen this. He's provided that revolution, revelation through his creation, through what we can see. And that allows us to understand that there is a creator and that he created everything around us, including ourselves. The complexity of the human body alone is enough to know there is a creator that designed it. Romans 1, 19 and 20 says, Since what we can know or what can be known about God is evident among them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, that is his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen since the creation of the world, being understood through what he has made. As a result, people are without excuse. Um, so we were in Sedona, Arizona, what is it, two weeks ago now? Um, has anyone been to Sedona? It's a pretty cool place. Uh, you stand in this little town, and I thought it was interesting to see this fancy little town that people travel from all over the world to come to with just gigantic cliffs and God's creation so prevalent surrounding it and then just this little anthill of man-made stuff in the middle of it. Um, there's also a really strong uh, influence of spirituality in that town. Um, you've got all sorts of shops selling everything you can think of, trinkets and different things that back that up, which as you look at that is simply people seeing creation and not recognizing the correct creator who actually made that. But it's a huge draw to people. But down deep, they understand that there was a creator, that God created the world. Um, that all of those big mountains and big cliffs that were surrounding us. Now we have to be a little careful. Creation itself is not God. It is not the object to be worshipped. Instead, our awe of what has been created should point us to falling on our knees in worship of the Creator. 
God's general revelation also does not have the power to save in and of itself. There is no salvation in simply recognizing that God exists. It is his special revelation, the second part, that provides a way to salvation. The special revelation is God speaking directly through, to us through scripture and through Jesus Christ. In John 1, 1 through 18, we see Jesus as the special revelation from God who gives salvation. We'll read through this passage and where you see Jesus projected as the word, you can think of that as the revelation as well. In the beginning was the word, or revelation, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through him, and apart from him, not one thing was created that has been created. Life was in him, and that life was the light of men. That light shines in the darkness, yet the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man named John who was sent from God. He came as a witness to testify about the light, so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. The true light, who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was created through him. Yet the world did not recognize him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood or of the will of flesh or of the will of man, but of God. The word became flesh and took up residence among us. We observed his glory, the glory as the one and only son from the father, full of grace and truth, John testified concerning him and exclaimed, This was the one of whom I said, The one coming after me has surpassed me, because he existed before me. Indeed, we have all received grace after grace from his fullness, for the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. The one and only Son, the one who is at the Father's side, he has revealed him. People can have our attention drawn away by God's incredible creation. However, our salvation is found in Christ alone. So secondly, we've recognized that God has a desire for us to know him. So what did he do about it? And that is found in the scriptures. God is the source of the scriptures. The entirety of the Bible, in its original format, from Genesis through Revelation, is perfectly inspired by God, both verbally and through the Holy Spirit, using human writers. The biblical writing all used human authors to actually put pen to paper, maybe with the one exception of God putting the Ten Commandments on the tablet. Otherwise, it was written by the hand of man. Sometimes these writers were specifically writing verbatim what God told them to write, but more often they were inspired by the Holy Spirit to write what God wanted written. God used regular men with varying cultural backgrounds, life experiences, and writing styles to write down his truth. As you read through scripture, you can see and hear each author's personality come through in how they write. It is an incredibly beautiful in that way. God uses people with all of our shortcomings to fulfill his perfect will. Nothing that he does is an error, and each of us is being used in some way to perfectly work out his plan for humanity. Scripture tells us that God is truth, and that scripture is his word of truth. 2 Timothy 3, 16-17 says, all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. His word is our ultimate map and compass to navigate life and to know how he wants us to live. 
The Bible refers to it as itself, excuse me, the Bible refers itself as God's truth. Psalm 12, 6 says, The words of the Lord are pure words, like silver refined in the earthen furnace, purified several times. And Proverbs 30, verse 5 says, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Jesus himself refers to God's word as truth. In John 17, 17, Jesus says, Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. The totality of Scripture, Old and New Testament, is confirmed in the authority of Jesus himself. For the Old Testament, he does this by proclaiming, him, proclaiming himself as the fulfillment of its prophecies in numerous places in Scripture, as well as by directly quoting the Old Testament as God's word in other places. In the New Testament, all scriptures are written by either those who Christ directly appointed or by those men who had been given consent by those apostles. We can conclude from this that the entirety of scripture is without error because it comes through the authority of Jesus in its original writings and will not fail as it directs our lives. Though God did not dictate each individual word as it is written in Scripture, because he didn't really want robots writing, he is concerned with every stroke of every author's pen. In Matthew 5.18, Jesus says, For I assure you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all things are accomplished. The Bible is trustworthy and reliable in all that it teaches. It must be the foundation for all of our preaching and teaching in the church, as well as our leadership has to be solidly based in Scripture. God's Word alone, through the guiding of the Holy Spirit and with the authority of Jesus, has the power to transform lives. God wants us to know Him. He desires a relationship with each of us and has communicated that desire for thousands of years through his word. This is the word of God. This is life. I promise that's the last time I'll do that. So the worship team comes forward and let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we just thank you again for your word, God for the truths that it reveals, for the conversation that you have with us through it, God. For revealing yourself through it, for revealing your plan for salvation through Jesus, uh, the gospel message, for giving us clarity to it through the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts, God. We pray that you would continue to move in our lives, move us towards being more like you. Let us use the word for that purpose. May it guide us every day in our life, God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.